Welcome to Let's Write This Movie. I am your screenwriter, Rene Garcia. And I am your script reader, Brian Glass. On this very special episode, we look back on how far we've come and how far we have yet to go. And I heap loads and loads of love onto Renee's writing. I wouldn't now. have it any other way. <laughs> now, let's write this movie. So let's just ask Brian, how was your week? Renee, I, I had a wonderful week. I spent three enlightened days in L.A., the city in which I grew up and could not possibly, if I tried, escape fast enough from. It was horrific, man. Sorry, anyone in L.A. who you know wants to buy scripts and stuff, but I just don't care for that town. <laughs> and I was in the valley, you know, I'm in the valley right next to all these studios. You know, I'm driving by them. In fact, I had lunch one day right next to some studio I'd never heard of. But I mean, these these things are everywhere, and uh, man, so just the the people, the traffic, the construction, the other 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 problems. I actually this is this is the much nicer version of the call that that I had with Renee a few days ago when I was in the airport in Burbank, yeah. just trying just clawing trying to claw my way out of that town. Um, it was not pleasant, nor was it productive. I spent an entire day on set on Thursday, um, delivering some washers to some to the to a client. Washers, you know, like the little metal washers you put mm. around screws. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm not going to get into how that worked, but I'm just telling you that was my entire day. That and going to the airport. Wow. When 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 you can say, all right, what did I do today? And you look at your checklist, and you've got deliver <laughs> washers. It's not a good day, man. Not no. a good day at all. I could not just. I just wanted to end it. And start Friday. So that's what I did. And on Friday, I, I did something similar to what you're doing, except that you kind of gave up carbs. I mostly gave up food because, you know, I've got to find some bones somewhere in my body. <laughs> that's just on my, my jawline. <laughs> so I'm on day two. Yeah. All right. So that goes. We'll check in every week. <laughs> so <it's like laughs> Make sure we're both like, alive. Exactly. It's just me talking to a blank screen that somehow you know started the feed started recording yeah renee renee you there <laughs> renee renee anyway we'll be the the opposite of the walking dead where instead of eating meat we're just like grabbing fries out of people's hands <laughs> bread you find yeah. us at olive garden never ending the uh, <laughs> pasta bowl <laughs> Yes, we're simulcasting this week from the Olive Garden. Exactly. Plural. Exactly. <laughs> one in California, one in Arizona. <laughs> yeah, that's it for me, man. That was my week, unfortunately. Yeah, well, you know, just um, to kind of uh, park here on L.A. Yeah, you know, L.A. is... Um, that's, that's a wonderfully ironic thing to say, by the way. I know. That's what everybody does every day, so I think people can relate. I'm just saying trying to find a parking spot in that oh, town is yeah. unreal. There's that, too. Unreal blocks uh, i had always before i had well just to take a step back uh everyone watching and listening i had spent uh close to a decade of covering the entertainment industry and before then i had very little reason to drive out to la and so there was always a little bit of trepidation on my part um mainly because you know i don't really know the town very well um and, you know, parking, I've always heard parking is a pain, all of that. Um, so, you know, early on, I would go to events like super early, like an hour and a half early if I had to, just to scope out a good parking spot. Right. <laughs> um, and, you know, 
little by little, I started to find like the prime real estate where I knew my car would be safe, where I knew there'd yeah. be plenty of parking, even if I had to walk a little bit. And, you know, you just slowly start to expand your knowledge of little areas around LA. But I gotta tell you, early on, uh, I remember running late to an event, to a, a movie screening, and it was on the west side, so it was in like Westwood. Mm. And the, if you have ever tried to park in Westwood, uh, you can never park. It's just yeah. people, continuously like circling buildings looking <laughs> like waiting for something to open up it's it's like uh the tenth level of hell um and so that's what i did you know i didn't i don't know westwood I don't, you know i rarely go there so me and my buddy my plus one we were just circling it's like just making wider and wider circles trying to find that parking spot we finally or finally finally found this parking lot that was like formed on top of a building it was really weird and it had like six parking spots and there was a parking attendant to you know take your money you know for the privilege of parking in one of these parking spots that was like five miles away i'm exaggerating it's like more like a you know half a mile away from our destination right so yeah i paid my 20 20 dollars to park there uh and then me and my buddy were just like running to this screening yeah in the but, middle of westwood exactly yeah but that is the LA life. Not for me. Not anymore. Yeah. No, Never hey, going good back for you. unless I have to. <laughs> well, no, I'm the same way. You know, I think that's one of the reasons why I gave it up. Um, yeah. You know, the last screen. Well, so uh, I say I gave up the entertainment industry uh, or uh, covering it, but I still go, you know, and there's a Marvel movie. I still have my, my Disney contacts like, oh, yeah, I'll screen that. No problem good your star wars movies or and my star wars movies right um but the last movie before i made the conscious decision to like stop all my my screenings except for disney yes uh, which is the one that broke your back i i can't oh man it was it was a bad movie it was like an independent movie that was like this movie sucks and i have to write something about it and i knew <laughs> um you know i couldn't just like excoriate it because you right. don't want to burn your contacts, right? It's an easy way to, like, you know, be blackballed and blacklisted. So, A, there was that. B, I had a, you know, two-hour drive home ahead of me yeah. because of all the traffic. And C, you know, you, you typically get vouchers for these screenings when they give you, like, a, a, a parking lot to park in. They give you these, these printed vouchers that mm. you stick in the machine. The machine is supposed to recognize it. And, you know, you're comped for the parking occasionally and more occasionally than people would you know more than people would like the machines don't recognize the voucher so now you're this guy who's holding up the rest of the other journalists who are trying to get out right and you're, you just want to solve the problem and there's no attendant there to help you right there's nobody so you're yeah. just this dude who's the roadblock so you know you fork out your credit card and you feed the machine and then you're free to go so yeah so not only did i have to drive all the way out here and then drive all the way home but now i also have to pay the exorbitant 20 dollar fee to mm. watch this crap movie yeah so you know it was like what am i doing what am i doing with my life <laughs> this is not getting me anywhere in the industry the way i wanted it to right yeah but you were very supportive of parking structures uh, yeah absolutely i think that's why they exist is because of me <laughs> i think they have my name the on movie. a plaque and a picture the movies are the side business. That's where the real money is, man, in yeah. parking. Oh, well, totally. <laughs> totally. I think that should be the racket we get into, to be honest. Yeah, Just have right. a screening room, a parking lot beneath it, <laughs> done, set for life. The movie is free. Yeah, exactly. $20 for the parking. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> wow. I guess that's all I wanted to say about L.A. for now, Brian. Uh, that's, uh, that's more than I wanted to hear about L.A. Oof. Well, you know, here's the thing, though. But you sell that script, and I'm happy to talk about L.A. all you want. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. The one thing I, I want to say about... I love L.A. Yeah. If you buy Renee's script, I love L.A. <laughs> Brian Newman, thank you. <laughs> the one, the one thing I do want to say about L.A., though, is that, <clears throat> um, you know, it, it does feel kind of like, as a person who doesn't live there and had to drive in all the time, yeah. it does yeah. kind of feel like this frontier that you slowly tame 
Um, and you know, there are, there are moments of that, uh, that felt adventurous. And yeah, every uh, time you're on the freeway, it feels adventurous, man. Talk about a frontier. It feels like the wild west when you get on those freeways. Oh, yeah. All of a sudden you're driving like in, you're in Orange County, I'm in Arizona and, and the lanes are much wider. Mm. You get in there all of a sudden, everything shrinks by about half, yeah. you know, you've got about three to four inches on either side, you know, before you're going to hit someone else and they're going to hit you and yelling at you. They're, they're honking. I'm like, what, mm. what is this? Exactly. This is like no man's land, land or yeah. lad. <laughs> <laughs> Who does that so, kid so belong to? We could do a whole show on LA, man. That's no man's lad. Uh, Snowman? <laughs> yes. <laughs> this joke, this bad joke is slowly evolving. Um, all right, Brian. Well, that's enough about talking about LA. All right. Let's so we have talk. something a little bit unique today, right? Yes. This is what I would like to call a milestone episode. I know we are only. This is episode eight. I know we are only eight episodes into this project, but as far as the script is concerned, uh, I, as a, a screenwriter, as someone who has written you know several scripts and can kind of gauge like how far I've come, um, this is pretty far in this this script, especially right. with how polished the pages are up until this point. Typically, I'll write the script once and it'll be bad but I just need to kind of like have the, the skeleton, the framework of it. Yeah. Uh, and then I'll, you know, I'll kind of sculpt the meat on it and just make it better. Right. Uh, we're kind of doing that now. You know, <laughs> I, I feel like certain parts of the script as we have it are already very close to like final, the final draft. It's yeah. uh, it's a strange experience. Uh, but I think it's also very effective because, you know, to be... 50 roughly 50 pages in and to have something that is approaching final draft as i go along it feels great and it feels like i feel like i've done a lot of good work so i think it's important to look back over the script as it is because we're at a point now as i feel it as a writer where i can see the rest of the journey essentially and i just need to make sure that everything that has that the foundation that we've built has all of the necessary elements that will get us to the end, yeah. uh, you know, as, as concisely as possible and with as little error. So there we are. I just want to review all of the pages. Um, I know we're going to talk about it soon, but you know, I did have to add some characters that uh, I did want in the second half of the movie, but it doesn't make sense not to have, uh, you know, these characters earlier on so that audiences can, you know, save a little spot in their brain for these characters. Right, right. Yeah, I think that's a smart move. And, um, you know, I was wondering as I was reading through here and just thinking about, you know, we were going to be talking about this as more of a milestone event. Um, do you in your mind look at this process at all in terms of acts? Like, do you feel like we're nearing the end of act one? Because to me, when I was when I was thinking about it, just you know, I I'm one of those people who watches movies, you know, and I'll, I'll be sitting there watching with my wife. I'm like, all right, bathroom break. This is the end of Act One. Like I can very clearly tell where those are. Yeah. During during a show, and I was wondering if after the montage, essentially, you know, we're about to enter Act Two because it's kind of like you know, this is where everything's going to shift. It's about to about to shift, and I felt like this is a natural stopping point to kind of regroup and you know see you know, how the process has been working, you know, if we're, if we're happy with, you know, this, this uh, dynamic, since we've never done anything like this before together, um, you know, but I was just curious if you, if you put that in terms of acts in your head or not. So this movie is unique. Like, I, you know, I typically try to follow the three act structure and have act one be very short. Hmm. You know, let's, let's get the inciting incident out of the way and have audiences understand exactly what's going on and okay this is the story that i'm part of right but because yeah. this movie has kind of that twist that um from dusk till dawn kind of twist where it's a, a genre bending movie uh i i i'm with you i feel like this is leading into the end of act one when once we enter the zombie movie the zombie aspect it's it is you know the zombie outbreak should be the inciting incident for all of the characters. Right. So, uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe, uh, other screenwriters would disagree and say, 
Um, you know, the gunfight, that was the inciting incident. Um, I'm not sure. I feel like this movie is, is, it's more complex than your average Hollywood industry movie. So, um, I don't know. Uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm siding with you at this point. And that's my answer. Yeah, because I know where we're going with this, essentially, I mean, since we did that overview. But to me, if I was a viewer, I would probably think that the death of Bao is the real inciting incident. So I'm not sure what's going to happen after that. You know what I mean? So from that vantage point, I think it's really interesting. You know what I mean? Like, I because it's going to kind of flip my expectations with this whole montage that's about to happen and what happens afterwards. I'm like, oh, okay, that really wasn't the story we're going to go down. You know, um, it was definitely something that's building the character characterization of long, you know, so we understand him better so we can really get delve deeper into him and, you know, the, the dynamic between him and Everett. But essentially that was not it, even though it really felt like it, as, you know, like on first viewing or reading, you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Not, I don't know if it's really like a MacGuffin or something, but I think it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting way to look at the, the act that like the traditional act structure. Right. So yeah. this might be, a five act movie. Mm. Um, I don't know. And I don't have any experience writing a five act movie. So uh, I, this is completely new territory for me. If that's what this movie ends up being. Yeah. Uh, okay. But whatever, you know, my thing is, you know, you, you have a formula and as long as you're not breaking the formula, as long as, you know, um, I don't know if maybe I misspoke. If you're going to refine a formula, make sure you don't you don't break it from the audience's perspective. You know, as long yeah. as the end solution of the formula is still something that is a compelling story, that was something that was entertaining, then I think you know, whatever you want to call the structure, it worked. I I think that the savvy director who gets this is going to play up that scene as it is the inciting incident just to subvert expectations hmm. and i think that once the audience finds out that that has happened and they're on a different journey then i think it's going to get like it's going to be one of those that's kind of like a wild ride right to the end like it could be a lot of fun you know what i mean it could be like oh okay all the bets are off on this one you know there are real consequences people are dying all over the place you know stuff is really happening here i don't know where it's going to go and for me personally, I love when I don't know where movies are going to go. Like if I'm watching a rom-com and I know they're going to end up together and I know that I'm watching a movie about the journey, that's okay. I have no problem with that because I don't know what that journey is going to be even if I know at the end they're going to get together. In this one, I don't even know where it's going. Right. You know, as, a, as, a, as just like a virgin audience member who's just watching this for the first time. And I think that's really, really cool and clever. And I think on the second viewing, it holds up too because you're like, okay, now I can see that this is – why am I watching this? Why is this happening? How does this inform the rest of, the, of you know, the actions in the movie? And it could be really, really well done in the right hands. That's what I'm hoping for. And yeah, man. I just hope my screenplay will communicate all of that excitement to a uh, producer, director, cinematographer. And it will, it, it's not just going to be fun for an audience, but fun yeah. filming it. Right. Right. Well, I mean, if I can kind of, um, tag on to some of the things you were, you were talking about in terms of what you did in this version here in terms of going back and kind of filling in those, um, putting putting some of those characters a little earlier in the, in the script. I always wanted to take a second and talk about my experience reading this this time because uh, I asked you what had changed just so I had that knowledge going into it. <clears throat> but I went back to page one and I just read it raw just to see how it, you know, how the whole thing played. And man, reading through this this time was was a completely different experience than before. Like you were talking about, you feeling that we're that it's it's much more polished than than, than usual for this um, at this stage. Man, this thing flowed. It was like where we polished it, and you you've 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 kind of you know made adjustments as we talked about were, were fantastic. It just flowed really nicely. Where you made the additions was super intelligent. I'm like, oh my god. This whole thing, like it read through, like you know, like like a knife on hot, a hot knife on butter, man. I was like, this is really good. Great. I really enjoyed it. I mean, you know, where it's like you're not sitting there to read to be critical necessarily. Yeah. I was reading for enjoyment. I was like, this is so fun. So um, I wanted to say that, uh, you know, whether 
the experiment between us doing this or not is working, man, I, I tell you, looking at these 48 pages, I'm really pleased. I think we're making something, you're making something really cool here. Hey, I really appreciate that, Brian. Uh, I was, I was a little worried. Uh, I was afraid, uh, maybe afraid is too strong of a word, but my concern was that I, I thought maybe I might be losing you a little bit, especially with our, our last episode where you didn't mm. like, where, you know, the sci-fi element. Yeah. I wondered if, if that was going to um, cloud your judgment going forward. You know, like maybe, uh, you know, given, given our discussion that you might, you might become a reluctant reader rather than mm. someone who could just be open-minded and say, okay, where's this going? Okay, well, yeah, I like this, I don't like this, or whatever. But you could still just go along for the journey, right? Um, but so it's nice to know that you're still on board and that you like what I've done so far. So, you know, just to, this is tangentially related. Mm -hmm. um, I really do think... <clears throat> I was unsure about this project and how it would affect me and and if it would really be a thing that kept me on task every week. Yeah. This has been a wonderful experience, not just in oh. terms of doing this project, but in terms of it being the monkey on my back to keep me writing. Um I don't know what else to say other than that that it, it you know, I don't know why I didn't do this earlier. Mm. We didn't think about it earlier. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, you know, uh <laughs> It's, it's, this is great. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, don't, I have no other words to describe it than that. Um, I can't wait and I, you know, no obligation, Brian, but um, I can't wait to keep doing this for other screenplays because I, I got a lot of stories to tell. Yeah. I, I just don't have the, the impetus to put it, put it all down on paper. And right, right, you right. Know, if you can be part of that journey, uh, you know, I think our collaboration has been, has been very good so far. Yeah, I totally agree. You know me, I'd love to do that stuff. All right. This is, this is show number two for us, man. So we came back for a reason too. Exactly. <laughs> what was that? I said, we both enjoyed it. I mean, yeah. the last time just happened to be silly, you know, a silly reason, but at least this time we're doing something for, you know, for something substantiated, some substantiated and substantial at the end. Uh, that's exactly it. You know, I really feel like once this is done, you know, the the internet has made it much easier for people like us who, you know, don't have any contacts necessarily, I have yeah. very limited budgets, to actually put something out there that can be quality and uh, still be a a manifestation of, of our idea that we can be proud of. Yeah, um, totally. You know, if this doesn't turn into a full-fledged you know, a, a feature length film, I'll, I'll be happy with a, you know, an animatic. Okay. I would watch that. Yeah, so, totally. Yeah. <laughs> I do. I do want to make a comment about something. I want, I want to address something that you mentioned, <clears throat> which was, you know, if I'm going to, if that change, you know, in terms of the sci-fi element is going to um, kind of inform the rest of my reading, um, if I'm going to become that reluctant reader, <clears throat> and I can talk a little bit more about this afterwards, but I just want to say generally, um, at the end of the day, this is your movie and I am providing feedback and I'm going to provide it as honestly and poignantly as I can to you. But at the end of the day, it's your decision to go whichever direction you want. And as that goes, I will respect that and, um, judge it on its own merits and give it my all no matter what, even if it's something that I may not necessarily agree with. Hey, at the end of the day, you've, you've got to make those decisions. You know, you're the guy with the, with the title page and you've made, you've made a lot of creative decisions. And if you think about it, you know, all of these are just coming from your head. It's not, you know what I mean? It's like, I don't know how to put this in words, but you're thinking of everything. You're generating all, all these ideas and, it's, and you're going a certain direction for whatever reason, you know, prompted that. And I've got to respect that. You know, so I will tell you if I say, hey, listen, I think as a reader or as a watcher or viewer, rather, rather um, I'm going to get lost here or I'm, you might lose me in terms of going a little bit too far. I'll tell you that. But if you decide to do it, that's up to you, man. You know what I mean? So uh, I wouldn't I would never like check out of a project is what I'm saying as well. You know, if, if I don't just because I don't agree with maybe a direction or two. Oh, I appreciate that. And I'm glad we could be aligned in what 
what this project is based on. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think this is a great segue to the second thing I wanted to talk about, which is setting some boundaries for this project, which I don't think I was very clear on in the beginning. So, you know, I, we, uh, we have a small audience right now, uh, but, you know, with any luck, the hope is that, you know, we'll have a, a wider audience, especially as our social media following starts to grow. And yeah, I'm getting, you know, some feedback from followers telling me that this is a, a fantastic uh, idea and it's it's very unique this project uh, whether or not that translates into viewership we'll see yeah but we're still early on and yeah, i'm in no rush because i think i think we're doing good work but with that said i don't want to get into a situation or rather i want to make sure ev i set everyone's expectations um while i want this to be a viewer centric um a uh it's not just a spectator uh, project, I guess, is what I'm getting at. I want there to be participation, but the participation has to be within certain boundaries of what I'm trying to do. So, right. you know, there is a corridor that there, that we're traveling down, which contains the script, contains the story, and there is some leeway within this corridor, but we can't exit the corridor and, and still be telling the story I want to tell. Right. So... As a writer, I'm going to run into problems. Uh, I may, you know, push the story in into a direction or in a direction that uh, isn't serving the story I wanted to tell. And, you know, I'm going to rely on people watching to to steer me back into the right direction. And I think, <clears throat> you know, while the last episode was a little difficult in the discussion that Brian and I had, I think it served the story to have that discussion. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want you know, viewers who might be interested in contributing to just keep that in mind. Um, I'm happy to get to get any feedback, but, you know, just, you know, go back to episode one and listen to to the treatment that we discussed. You know, that's the story I'm trying to tell. If you have ideas that best serve that story, then please, you know, send them our way. Happy to consider them. And this will this concept or uh, this proviso, these this these requirements uh, will be consistent throughout every every screenplay I write, as long as yeah, this project right. continues. Yeah, because ultimately it's your idea, and if someone helps you kind of massage it a little bit, you know, kind of like what I'm doing, then great. And if it's not in service of your project, then say, hey, you guys should write that yourself. <laughs> and I fully support it. Yeah, precisely. <laughs> <laughs> where's the slapstick element well right. there's not going to be one <laughs> i think that's fair man okay so nothing else to add on that huh brian no man i i think that's clear and i you know you kind of gave me some foreshadowing when you're going to talk about that and i thought that's probably what he's going to say and there you are <laughs> all i can do is agree man it's like yeah it makes sense perfect because you're, you're the guy so so should we go into um, some of these changes that you made in the uh, existing script? Yeah, I let's kinda... do that. All right. So let's get to, since we're not performing, um, we'll have our faces on the screen. How's that? Hello. I'm always happy to have my face on the screen. I know. Me too, Brian. <laughs> Me too. That wasn't scary at all. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the reasons I don't ever watch myself. It never happened if I don't see it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it didn't exist. Right. Okay, so the first big change, and uh, please correct me if I'm wrong here, Brian, it is uh, introducing some new characters after Everett and Stan are introduced. Right. Okay, so this is... Uh, let's see. I know I'm getting close. Ah, page 17. Yeah. <clears throat> Mortimer. Okay, so we've already mentioned Mortimer and uh, Miss Stapleton in our previous episode, but they were introduced much later in the script, like page 40-something. Now they're page 17. They are customers who are uh, patronizing the, uh, the local general goods store. And they just have a quick exchange with Stan. And 
I, I think I like how I handled this because it's just very quick exchanges, but we learn, well, I won't say so much of their characters, but we give these characters just a little bit of character to right. hang our hat on. Yeah. So as we go forward, do you want, before we talk too much about this, should we just go ahead and perform from 17 to the top of 19? The bottom of 17 to the top of 19? Oh. Just so people can hear it? Uh, or no? Well, you know, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't rehearse any of this. I thought we would just talk about it. <laughs> well, you've got Mortimer's voice already. We just—I don't remember what I did. Oh, you know what? I do remember Mortimer, and I didn't do a voice. Um, it's all Renee. <laughs> it's all Renee, exactly. It's all me. <laughs> One man show. <laughs> well, Rebecca's new, right? Uh, Rebecca is new as well. <clears throat> you, you can pull sexy any day, man. That's easy. Thanks, bro. Thanks. Of course, <laughs> I'm doing it right now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Hey, if you're not comfortable doing it, that's fine. But, uh, you know, I'm always down for a little ad hoc performance. Um, I would rather just talk this out if that's all right. What? You want me to hide your face, Brian? Just have the script. It's fine. I'm ready. I just zoomed up on your face. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Um, you know, I gave gave Mortimer... You know, I kind of uh, addressed or rather gave the actor some lines and some, some acting direction here to be a little slower, which is how I describe him. Right. Um, and, I, you know, I like the little clever line that I yeah. give Stan. Well, we can't, they can't hear it, though, because we won't perform Oh, it, my God. Come there's on. cleverness, let me tell you. Pure cleverosity. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool, man. Yeah, oh, I like wow. it too. People can read it on let's write this movie.com. There you go. See? <laughs> Plenty of opportunity Page to plug the site. <laughs> uh, let's write this movie.com. Let's not read this or perform, perform this movie, but wow. let's write this movie.com. <laughs> Wow, Brian, you're killing me over here. All right. Exterior, Porter's gen Oh, sorry. That's fine. Let's do it. Let's do it. No, because I'll probably hear something afterwards about it. <laughs> I already hit our faces, bro. We got the the full screen script up. Let's go. No, I'll probably mess up every line. That's great. Big talker. Exterior, Porter's general goods. <laughs> Continuous. <laughs> The general goods store is busy with all walks of life, coming in and out with the necessities for their day. Stan leans on the wall by the door. The Undertaker, Mortimer... Help me. Caron. Mortimer Caron, 50, a slow, well-meaning man like myself, exits with a box full of nails in hand. Stan. Afternoon, Mortimer. How's the undertaking business? Mortimer. A little slow, Sheriff. Not sure if I should be grateful for that. Stan. Did I say Mortimer? I did say Mortimer, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Stan. Well, I'm sure business will pick up soon. The only thing you can count on in life is death. Stan smiles at his own cleverness, but it takes Mortimer a few moments to realize it. Then he smiles big and leaves. As he does, the schoolmistress, Miss Stapleton, 20, approaches. Miss Stapleton. <laughs> Sheriff. Stan, Miss Stapleton. Her eyes brighten and she blushes. Miss Stapleton, you know my name? Stan, well, you're the school mistress. I thought it was wise to know the lady teaching our young. She smiles. What are you here for? Miss Stapleton, oh, just some supplies. I'm teaching the children penmanship and I need some chalk. I thought I might pick up some. Stan, <laughs> yeah, that, that's mighty nice. Good seeing you. His attention is drawn to the buxom blonde woman walking his way, dressed in finery with her small hat and parasol. She's dressed to emulate a refined woman, but her corset is a little too tight and her makeup a little too thick. Miss Stapleton sees what Stan is looking at and sulks into the store. The blonde woman, Rebecca Hayes, 25, approaches Stan. Stan, Rebecca, you are the highlight of my day. <laughs> Rebecca. <laughs> Careful, Sheriff. This is how rumors start. You don't want people talking now, do you? Stan, let them talk all they want, as long as I'm the only one who gets to touch. 
Rebecca, we'll see about that tonight. She kisses her fingertip and playfully touches the tip of Stan's nose with it before walking away. Every man she walks by turns to pass, turns to watch her pass. Stan grins and takes his place by the store door once more. I think that's and enough. See. Okay, see. great. See, we got a little sexy in there. I know, I know. People couldn't see, but I was uh, kind of sashaying in place a little bit as I read, just to get into character. I didn't see either. <laughs> I can't look at you while I'm reading. I'll start laughing, so that's not going to happen. Uh, well. <laughs> you want my notes on this, man? Give it to me. Uh, <clears throat> the little thing between Miss Stapleton and Stan where she's always talking, and he's like, yeah, yeah that's, that's mighty nice. Mm -hmm. Loved it. Yeah. Loved it. See, that's what I'm yeah. talking about. Suddenly, I've got this little bit of character between these yeah. two. You know, she totally. is enamored with the sheriff. He doesn't care about her. He cares about this other lady. Right. Exactly. Loved it. I love that we're getting little layers of these people now. And, and the whole thing with uh, Rebecca kissing his finger, boop, booping him on yeah. the nose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, that's my only, those are my only notes for this. I really just like, yeah, I love it. That's what I was saying. I was reading this through all the stuff that you had really massaged. And then this new edition just fit in really nicely and smoothly. Loved yeah. it, dude. Yeah. Okay, cool. so the next, well, this isn't a really big thing, but uh, let's see here. In the gunfight. 25. <laughs> Middle of 25. Yeah. <laughs> what? what? Funny. What's happening? What Mortimer here? does. Oh, right. I did add that, didn't I? Well, yeah. this is kind of hacky. Uh, you know, it's been done many times. It's still funny. But that's the thing. It's it's almost yeah. like it's become a staple almost right. in, in and of itself or in its own right. <clears throat> so, you know, and it kind of dovetails nicely with his conversation with Stan earlier where, you know, Stan says, ah, business is going to pick up, you know. So, Siri, what's happening? Don't you mind anything, Renee. I never Continue. do. You want to read this thing about Mortimer or? Nah. Oh, okay. So yeah, thing. just to, in case people can't read it, uh, Mortimer sees the gunfight about to happen. Well, first of all, what I added here is, once again, I wanted to make sure that the characters that the audience just met don't disappear. I want them to know that these characters, you know, they are more or less important to the story because they come up later. Um, and so here we have the pivotal gunfight. This is a big moment that invo that affects everybody. So this could be considered possibly like uh, the inciting incident because it's affecting all of the char known characters. Right. Uh, I, you know, I reintroduce Miss Stapleton. She's walking down with her supplies and she sees what's happening, ducks behind a corner, but is still watching out of curiosity. Mortimer comes out and he sees the gunfight is, is beginning. And so... <clears throat> He measures, you know, estimates from where his vantage point, like, ah, oh, yeah, okay. This guy, you know, uh, which we've seen in many movies already, like Back to the Future 3, um, Still fist, fun. Fistful of Dollars. I mean, it's fun. It's fun because it happens at a part before it gets really too serious. You yeah. know, we hear the, the little line between the two of them, and then you see it happen, and it's not going to break up any of the action. So, I mean, it's, a, it's like a perfect spot for it. Right, right. Per yeah. yeah, no, you're absolutely right. All right. Uh, and then I also reintroduce, or r <clears throat> rather give um, Maggie, Ray, and Tommy, uh, you know, just a, a, a quick mention in the yeah. action at the bottom of 26, just to show that, hey, they're still here, and they're seeing what's happening as well. Yep. So there we go. Yeah, smooth. Uh, so before you go to the new edition on, yeah. 20, on 28, um, just because I've been seeing for the last couple of shows that we've done... Um, this is the first time I've seen your rewrite of this whole scene of the, uh, of the shooting, you know, the, the shootout. So I thought this was efficient and, and well done, you know, this whole thing with, uh, with bow getting shot and then all the, all the stuff between long and, and the other guys was now condensed in front, I think from three pages, if I remember correctly to this new one. So I totally. thought it was all there. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, Brian, let me, um, you know, I really like this, uh, the shootout scene. I, I don't think people have, have, uh, 
had a chance to, you know, hear the condensed version. Uh, okay. If you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and read this. I got the uh, the full screen up, the full script up here. So um, it's just going to be me for a little bit. Yeah, no worries. Why don't you do me first? Take about two minutes to read it. Yeah, we will do. Okay. So this is the shootout, the condensed version. Exterior, Sally Saloon, continuous. A rifle shot hits Bao in the chest as he squeezes his trigger. Bao's bullet grazes Everett across his temple, sending him to the ground. Long is stunned momentarily as he watches his brother fall, but regains his awareness quickly. He senses attackers moving into position around him. Stan on the roof of porters, a man with a rifle hiding around a corner, two men with pistols behind stacked barrels, another man with a shotgun behind a low fence. <clears throat> <clears throat> The anguish drains from Long's face as his instincts and reflexes take over. He draws both pistols. The inexperience of the posse in a gunfight is apparent as the men are slow to fire and don't take time to aim. Nevertheless, the errant bullets force Long back into the street every time he moves for cover. Similarly, Long suppresses his attackers with well-aimed and timed shots, especially at Stan, whose hat is shot off the first time he rises out of cover. Every time he tries to take a shot, Long sends a bullet his way. A bullet grazes Long's bicep. Almost without looking, Long returns fire instantaneously, along the same trajectory, killing the shooter. Another bullet nicks Long's ear. Again, without looking, he returns fire along that trajectory, killing another man. Another exchange sends another man down, but Long is grazed in the thigh. The man with the shotgun seizes the opportunity and fires buckshot at that clips Long, spinning him to the ground. But even while on his back, Long is deadly accurate and finishes off the man with the shotgun. Without any bullets left... <clears throat> excuse me. Without any bullets left to suppress Stan, Long reloads frantically, flicking chambers of his... Well, I think that should say flicking the chambers of his revolvers into place. Just as Stan rises, Long unloads all of his bullets. And that is the shorter condensed version right let me get us back very clean so yeah you know now it's reduced to about a page and i right. think it just moves a lot faster you know leave it to the choreographers to to say uh, you know to decide how they're going to do all of that i didn't i don't right. think it's necessary to talk about teeth exploding out of the backs of heads <laughs> they may want. They may want to read the novel. It's okay. They can yeah, do that. There you they go. Need a little more. They can almost talk to the writer. Hey, do you have some thoughts about teeth in the scene? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you asked. <clears throat> <laughs> so, is the next thing on thirty-eight? Um. Let me just pull my script up one more time. Thirty-eight. Thirty-eight. The bottom. This is the addition, or this is the movement of the um, the flashback into a dream. Mm. <clears throat> right. Right. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, bottom of 38, right? Yep. Yeah, okay. I don't know if we need to... Do we need to read this i don't think so oh yeah so. because it's mostly action you don't want to read brian i'll be more than happy to read interior <laughs> dirty shack <laughs> you know it's really short it's what is it like three paragraphs <laughs> yeah I'll read um it. <clears throat> if you want i we could just describe it actually so because of brian's feedback and i really liked it you know he said that um it made more sense to have this the these this information the, the essentially a flashback happen before long gets up and talks you know kind of waxes uh it's not really poetic necessarily but he he shows his softer side yeah. while he's in the cell and you know it doesn't break up that moment right um and i thought about it and it, that made so much sense like as an audience member i would want to be there as well I don't need to be transported in time to another place because you lose the emotional value that you've set up 
when you know the flashback has you know a different range of emotion you know it, it the flashback in the last version ended with smiles and you know the feeling of adventure on this ship just right. to get this thrown back into the cell yeah it didn't didn't read correctly uh on second or after the discussion so <clears throat> this i think much more powerful just to summarize it for everybody um it is a dream sequence we it is essentially a flashback uh but the audience won't know they're just going to know like hey we're seeing something happening 30 years before who are these kids possibly they are long and bow we're not sure it's never explicitly said but it is right. long and bow so <clears throat> long has replaced the mother sleeping on this uh, pile of straw and he's sleeping face up and that's important because long in uh, the the cell is also sleeping face up so mm. when we come back to long it can be kind of this match cut where you know the kid 15 year old long starts to wake up when he hears his brother is in trouble and then long the adult long sh you know gets up in the cell um and i think that can be a very powerful transition so very quickly uh the little brother bow is uh, is you know he's five years old he's playing with his wooden boat and he's lost in his imagination sailing it around in the air it takes him outside and this province is just devastated with poverty uh and the kid he's oblivious because he's a kid he doesn't know any better yeah. uh so you know, the kid's playing with the boat finds a little dirty puddle he's playing with the boat in the puddle and we get these hungry dogs that stalk him and he doesn't realize it because he's so lost in his imagination but once the dogs start to attack him that's when he panics and starts trying to get back to the shack he's crying out po possibly for his brother um, or possibly just crying out, but because Long is so uh, attuned to his family in distress, it starts to rouse him from his sleep, and that's when we match cut to adult Long in the cell. And I just think that that I liked, I really liked that transition. So that's my thoughts, Brian. What did you think? Yeah, I did too. I think you took a lot of the backstory that you built and, and placing into one event. I thought was really intelligent. The way I read it was that this is something that actually took place in the past. And this was an instance where Bao was, you know, in, in a really poor position and Long was able to, to save him. And that juxtaposed with what just happened and right. him now not having to, a chance to save him and actually having him die in his hands, his arms, was like really powerful um, because he's having, especially because he's having such a flashback. You know, it's to me, it informed what happened next in the cell so well and it really built an interesting tension that wasn't there before you know that it was like it was much deeper and more yeah. resonant and so yeah I was, I was i was totally on board and i was like i i thought you were going to kind of take what you wrote before and transfer it here but what you did in terms of raising the stakes a little bit more i thought it worked really really well man i, I really i mean this this uh my feedback today has become a lot of, Hey, I really like this really well. Sorry, man. I know you wanted the negative feedback. I don't have a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I really liked all the new additions. I'm telling you these for these pages really, they read so much easier to me and all the, all the changes were really um, in service of the script and in service of, you know, the experience of reading it or, or, or watching it. Um, like I, I'm totally on board with these changes, man. Great. That's yeah. Fantastic. So, just to touch briefly on, uh, you know, your, your illusion there. Um, you know, when it comes down to like a, a kind of a thumbs up, thumbs down scenario, which is kind of what I'm looking for as well, in that I made this change, does it work? Yes or no? <clears throat> uh, there's no real need to tell me, to not tell me that something is working. So. Yeah, but I'll wax anyway. Okay. Because... <laughs> Cause that's who I am. <laughs> well, what I'm saying I is, I give you a, uh, that's good. I, I do want the criticism because I, right. you know, as I mentioned in an outtake, criticism is what makes me better. Mm -hmm. But I also need to know, did this work or, or not? So, uh, I, yes. even though it's not, yeah, the thing, even if it's a yes, I'll still take that. That's still meaningful to me. That still has value yeah. because I, I don't know if something I've made or I've, I've changed works so yeah there we are yeah. okay 
Okay, what was the next big change, Brian? Well, I think it's it's basically on the bottom of 42. Um, we're going to get a little bit more of Bill and Bud, and then mm, they're going to have right. that whole rewrite, basically, at that point. So, that scene is one that's changed more than anything else. Uh, I did change something a little before that, um, mm. above the description above the slug line road, continuous, exter uh, exterior. Yeah, that's where I started. Bill and Bud Trek, that one. Yeah, right above that, yeah. though. Um, so the, the, the streak of the right. meteorite, I, I did add that there's dust kind of falling across the town and people are like, oh, Dang. this is great. We're amazed. Let's stick our tongue out and taste it kind of thing. Like it's snow. I thought they were dancing. Were they well, dancing in? of course, people are dancing, but I'm just saying that I think if, you know, people are all are amazed, they'd do stupid things like, sure. Yeah. Let me rub it in my eyes. <laughs> 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 Well, I mean, you know, the idea is that this is not something that's happened before, so they don't know what to do and how to react. Yeah. But I did like that we saw that, and then it must have been like a page or two later that this happens, and it puts me right back in that exact frame of time. Right. You know, we can't, how else are you going to show it unless you're splitting the screen? So I thought yeah. that was a really good way to do it. And I think before we started in the interior, it gets hit. Now we're on the exterior, and we're seeing it. Yeah. And you know, we're seeing it fly across. And, yeah, I think that was really cool. We probably should, since this is all new, um, perform this don't you think yeah this is this is quite a bit different uh okay that's fine <clears throat> and then, i don't have the the guttural voices now to work with because you know bill and bud are are still friends <laughs> yeah. before you know <laughs> right. bill or no bud was already becoming like this animal i can taste it <sighs> is it bud or bill or bill or bud i can never bill remember. spits it was, it was bud a, it was <laughs> It was a script joke, man. I know. <laughs> I know. So we'll do bottom of 42 through 40, all of 43, right? All right. Here we go. Yeah, because then we go back over to Petrov. All right, Brian. Hit me. <sighs> Exterior. Road. Continuous. Bill and Bud trek back to their stake. Bill pushes a wheelbarrow while Bill lights the way with a lantern. The wound on his arm looks somehow, somehow looks worse. A stagecoach approaches, and the prospectors step aside. The stagecoach stops. It's... Old Man Prophet. Well, Bud and Bill. Or is it Bill and Bud? I can never remember. Bud. What do you want, Prophet? Old Man Prophet. You know what I want. That stake of yours is worthless in your hands. You don't have the manpower or the gumption to make it profitable. Sell it to me and live your lives. Bill, your offer's no good. Not when it's a fraction of what we paid. Not when we're about to strike it rich. Old man profit. <laughs> Listen, boy. The only one getting rich around here is me. You don't want to sell? Fine. Work yourself to death. He rides away. Bill watches him go and spits, while Bud mutters something under his breath and spits. Oh, while old... sorry, I don't know why the, he spits too. Whatever. Uh, Everyone is spitting now. They're all spitting. <laughs> 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 while, while old man Prophet is out of sight, the prospectors pick up to leave. They stop when they hear a whistling sound. They look around and then slowly up as the environment around them lights up green. A meteorite hurtles overhead and slams into their stake in the distance. Bill and Bud look at each other, and they make a dash for the mine. Interior, prospector stake. Minutes later, the meteorite has punched a hole in the mine ceiling and broken into a million shards that punctuate the walls and floor. They catch the light from Bud's lantern mysteriously, almost as if they're emitting light and glowing. Bill. What is it, Bud? Bud. I don't know, Bill. They look like... gems. Bill reaches out and touches one. Its sharp edge cuts his, cuts his hand. He tries again, gingerly, and snaps off a shard. Bill. A shard. A sh a sh <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> uh, let's try that again. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Bill. Who's Bill? Bill is the spitting one, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, Bill, here we go, here we go. Bill. Emeralds, 
These are emeralds. We're going to be rich. They hug each other vigorously and begin snapping shards and tossing them into the wheelbarrow. They repeatedly get cut, but it doesn't phase them. All right. Dude, you're funny that you picked up on the little one I gave early. <laughs> I thought I was going to do it. So um, I'll put this succinctly to you. Okay. Every issue I had before has been 100% addressed. And I think it reads very well. All right. Great. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I'm not going to pile on all the, all the, uh, you know, the love this time. No, no, I that's thought. fine. I, I wasn't sure. But on, but on your notes, you'll see love it. And oh, great. Like hearts, <laughs> hearts with arrows through them. Yes. My name in the margin over and over again. Renee <laughs> <Renee> glass. Wait. <laughs> okay. Um, good. So here's the thing. Even though uh, I still want the sci-fi element like yes there's something about these shards that came from outer space yeah uh, so i hope i didn't tone that out of the script like i toned it it's... down but i still want it to be this could it be that these this mysterious rock from outer space has affected everybody with the dust falling you know that that to me is an inescapable sci-fi uh trope and i just yeah, want to yeah. make sure it's still um it still has a little bit of weight in the audience's mind. Yeah, I don't know if it's drawing too fine a point on it or being too distinctive, <clears throat> but to me it went from being kind of sci-fi to more otherworldly. Okay. And I just thought it was the perfect amount of it where um, I could still see, you know, that they're they're interpreting something incorrectly, which I thought was really cool because now we're digging into them a little bit. Like these aren't highly educated people and they're just yeah. going to take something that looks like greenish and gem ish as, as an emerald you know and let's just ah, snap everything off I loved it so i think that i think it really plays into the characterization that you drew for these guys and gives you that mysterious kind of other otherworldly element okay and i don't know if, if i mentioned this before or if it's something off a note we, we talked about but understanding a little bit more of profit's interest in their stake i thought was just a little bit cleaner here too so like, yeah why he was interacting with them <clears throat> right right like you know it didn't make sense, or it wasn't quite clear in the last version why Prophet would want uh, a st <clears throat> excuse me a steak that was worthless. <clears throat> but for him to describe, you know, that he's the one with the manpower to make this profitable, um, uh, it added a reason. And I don't yeah. know if that reason is accurate, like if it's realistic, but at least it's it's a believable reason. Yeah, I think it's realistic to say that. They may have bought something. Maybe they put all their money into it, but they yeah. don't have the manpower literally to mine it, or they don't have the wherewithal or know how to do it right. Right. I think that makes total sense. You okay. know, there are only two guys, whereas he's got this crew of people. Yeah. You know, and um, no, I think it made total sense. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Okay. So I think, oh, well, we did. Okay. So there is a small a change to the exchange when. Um, Bill and Bud come back from the mine with yes. a wheelbarrow full of their gems. Totally. So, do we need to perform this? I don't. I don't think so. Um, <clears throat> it's very short. I mean, it ends the same way. There's spit, and it's glowing a faint green, if I remember correct. Yeah, yeah. You so, and Bill and like, Bud, ah. to summarize, they're not angry with each other. Right. Like they aren't affected yet by whatever the things are that are affecting people <clears throat> so uh instead uh zeke surprises them um and you know bill he's chewing his tobacco he spits he almost hits zeke they don't realize it, and this is how the interaction plays out with zeke why why it begins at all because zeke almost gets spat on right um, disgusting yeah exactly <laughs> and <laughs> and bill <clears throat> you know he chews tobacco because it's cheap uh, whereas now that he thinks he's going to be rich, he's like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm going to quit tomorrow. I'm going to get me a $10 cigar. Right. And, yeah, you know, Bud's talking about how he's going to spend his money. So. <laughs> right. There you go. Yeah, that's great. 
yeah but definitely brought in that cool element to it now so honestly i look for it in terms of you know the story you're trying to tell am i getting pulled out for any reason i'm like no nope this is like it's just weird enough that it belongs in the movie and seems like it's it just seems more poignant great yeah <clears throat> all right brian is there anything else you want to discuss before we get into the performance so the performance starts right here um, right ex exterior sally saloon yes right the continuous one okay yeah we can go <clears throat> no i don't have anything else really before that i have i have one note but it's not for something you read dead i can give it to you now if you want let's just, do it not that it's in order or anything but this is actually way back on on i have two notes way back way 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 back okay on page two. Oh my god um, <laughs> so go back to page two in the middle all right um and i didn't do my due diligence but masked man one which is long didn't he say something like i'll have you back on your way post haste it's all before? it's gone now oh i like that here's the thing part of, one of the things i changed is one, one of my concer concerns <clears throat> a few episodes ago was that Long sounded too educated here in the beginning. Too aristocratic. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And the reason he sounded that way is because I had a different kind of character for him. Like I, I had discussed previously, I wanted him to be fully integrated where he had right. kind of a Southern accent, had you know no Chinese accent at all. And uh, you know that doesn't carry through for the rest of the movie. So no. had to go back and trim it down. Yeah, but if they get like Keanu Reeves to play it, you know, to play the Asian guy, you know, he'll start <laughs> off with he'll start off with the accent on the first page and lose it anyway. So it's there. I apologize it's there the <laughs> for the delay. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, exactly. All right. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is on page six, and this is uh, just a little tweak. So this is the the discussion between Sam and Long. You know they're talking towards the towards the top, and we have the little description that says Long looks up at the passenger car windows and sees curious faces peeking out. He tries to pistol on them, and they scurry away. Um, I was just thinking, I kind of like that Long has that. I wouldn't say supernatural, but he's got that <clears throat> that ability to really, you know, kind of find where the the target is very quickly without mm. you know, spending a lot of time looking, just to kind of make it more maybe uh superhumanish to in a way without that, looking he shoots up not shoots up but you know he notices something out of the corner of his eye and he points the gun at him without <laughs> without looking okay you know, and they, and then, they, oh, then they bristle away you know that he's just like carrying on his conversation with with sam as this is happening and he's just like don't even waste my time you know yeah no no totally i think it's that would be nice foreshadowing for the gunfight so right exactly okay. and that was it before we get to the new stuff man all just right a couple little notes Let's get back to the new stuff. All right. <clears throat> Tell me when you're ready to perform. Unfortunately, um, Sally has no lines, so that's always a shame for me. <laughs> I I'm like going to give her Sally. a monologue later, just for you, Brian. <laughs> Two pages worth. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> just, that's all you hear. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> it's a song I wrote just for you, Brian. Uh, all right shall we <clears throat> okay hang on hang on boom so we are middle we of are. 46 do it <clears throat> exterior sally saloon continuous stan looks in through the window and sees a raucous crowd not seeing anything wrong he turns around and crosses the street to the nine lives interior nine lives continuous the vibe inside is more subdued and refined the men here are quieter, opting to listen to the women's whispers instead. A small band plays a whimsical tune as a burlesque show takes place on stage. The girls are all dressed the same. The girls all, all place their giant feather fans in the center, then pull them away dramatically, revealing Rebecca sporting a scintillating short dress. She's obviously the star. She spots Stan at the bar and winks. He smiles back. Exterior, Fort Bliss, night. The soldiers from Epitaph ride up to the watch by the gate. Torches on walls cast pools of light in the unending darkness of the desert. The watch commander approaches. Watch commander. State your business. Soldier number one. Yes, sir. We come from Epitaph. Half a day's ride from here. Watch commander. I know it. Go on. Soldier number one. 
Well, sir, we got a soldier that came down with something awful. The local doctor couldn't fix him, so we thought we'd bring him here. But he passed a few hours ago. The fort was closer than town, so we came here. One of the men on watch walks to the back of the cart and flips the bank blanket back. The sixth soldier is dead. The watchman nods at the watch commander. Watch commander, bring him in. Put him in the infirmary for now. Then get some chow. We'll let the lieutenant major decide what to do next when he arrives in the morning. Interior, Fort Bliss, infirmary, minutes later. <clears throat> the soldiers from Epitaph carry the body still wrapped in a blanket and lay it on a table. They exit. The corpse lies there in silence, completely motionless. Interior, undertakers, continuous. Mortimer submerges his rag into the bucket of water that he fetched from the water pump. He uses the rag to wipe the blood off a naked body splayed out on the table. Other naked bodies show that they have been recently cleaned. They don't move. Interior, old shack, continuous. The old man who bought the waters of life from Petrov dangles the bottle in front of his roommate, another old man. The first old man laughs malevolently as he snatches the bottle away and downs it. He lies down on the cot to sleep. The other old man makes a face and goes to his cot to sleep. Interior, modest bedroom, continuous. The homely woman who, brought, who bought the love potion holds it to her chest, shuts her eyes, and breathes deeply before drinking it. She sets the bottle down next to a small framed portrait on her nightstand and smiles. She blows out a candle. Interior, neat bedroom, continuous. A match is struck and it lights a small lantern, revealing Miss Stampleton in her bedroom. She opens a book and begins reading it in bed. She reaches over to a wooden cup and drinks some water. She frowns at the taste, but finishes it. Dun, dun, dun. I know. The big setup. Like, oh! Yeah, so uh, really quickly, I know you have some <clears throat> feedback here, but uh, I, I thought about this after I finished the sequence. There, there's more yeah. to it because I still have to show Bud and Bill you know, sleeping in their bed, uh, and they're both starting to get affected by the things. Right. Uh, like maybe they're kind of feverish as they're trying to sleep. Um, so as I started to think about how these scenes would cut together, I kind of like, you know, we start off in the infirmary and maybe instead of me talking about how the corpse is motionless, maybe an arm of the corpse on the table like slips out and just dangles, mm -hmm. right? And then we cut to the undertaker and Mortimer reaches down to, or maybe it's almost like surreal where it's the same scene. It's, there are no cuts, right? Mm -hmm. Mortimer mm -hmm. walks in and lifts that arm and puts it on the table. And we see that we're no longer in the infirmary. We're actually in Mortimer's. Mm -hmm. And this okay. is an arm of a, you know, a body that he's working on as he's walking by, right, with mm -hmm. his bucket. <clears throat> Does this make sense, Brian, how I'm describing it? Yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> that way, you know, there's always this one little element that's tying all of these little sequences together. Now, I know that probably won't work for every little thing here. Right. <laughs> um, and, and one more thing I, I forgot to write in here is that I needed to show in Mortimer's that instead of showing a lot of naked bodies, I should show a lot of clothed bodies to show that there are still a lot of people to work on. And one of mm -hmm. them needs to be Bao because in order for the last or uh, one of the later sequences to work, Bao has to be still in his clothes with the dynamite in his belt. Mm, okay. Yeah, plus it'd be good to see him there too. Yeah. Because we've been, we've been without him for a number of minutes. Yeah, exactly. So now to see him again, it's like, ah, like that guy. Right. Yeah, um, okay, that makes sense. So um, <laughs> the reason I, the reason I, I, I thought I like, about, uh -huh. sorry, just really quickly, the reason I thought about this kind of like montage of, of like, similar actions bleeding into uh, other scenes with of different people. <clears throat> I, I was reminded, did you ever see uh, Requiem for a Dream? Yeah. Yeah. So I, not to get into too much detail, I don't want to spoil anything for people who haven't seen it, but towards the end, there's a montage of all the, the characters as the movie's kind of winding down. And Variant. one thing that ties all of their disparate scenes uh, is the the different characters turning left in their bed. Like they're all going to sleep and they all turn yeah. left. Like they all turn on their side to sleep. Um, and I don't know why that action, why that was the choice that the, the director or the writer 
the writer director actually um <laughs> to, you know chose to make but it was just something i noticed and it did add a little bit of like cohesion to all of these scenes and right right you know if i can have a little bit of that element here then why not right right no i think that's a good idea i'm sure that if it was in the hand that was aronofsky right yeah i'm sure if this was in his hands he probably would do something like that anyway but um i think it's cool uh you know i think there are ways to do it on the page as well but i'm just i'm just wondering how you do that <clears throat> i mean like you could definitely tie in um you can go from like the the, the bucket that uh uh, that Mortimer has to the water that the homely woman is, um, I'm sorry, not the homely woman, but the, um, that Miss Stapleton is drinking. You know what I mean? You can kind of go into there, you know, to that, to that bucket and then pop into her cup as an example. But, mm. um, but they're all, I mean, since we have possibly, since we've never really nailed down which one of these is the trigger or if all of them are a trigger, you know, it's almost like they have, they have to be in um, like couplets or something, you know? where maybe the uh the two love potions like you have them together right you know are are together like they are but maybe the water ones are together i'm not sure i'm not sure how you do that exactly but i think it's a good idea to, to have that as a as a through a through line through this this section i mean honestly as i read it um i was just thinking well a director's probably gonna make some interesting choices here but to me on the page um I can't remember what I was listening to, but it was some podcast where they're talking. Oh, I know what it was. It was, uh, you know, they're making the the uh, the podcast Homecoming into the the TV show. Yeah. So so now um, what they're doing is as part of this is um, on the podcast feed they're putting in uh, basically kind of like a four part series about the making of like how did mm. it transition from the podcast to the script. And my God, it's, it is super, super interesting. But one of the things you hear is like the set designer talking and she's like, well, I only had this to work with. So I thought I'd just do this, you know, and where she took something small and just made it into this very elaborate type of environment. Cause that's yeah. their job. You know, it's like, well, <clears throat> at some point it, it's kind of like, you know, that whole, that whole uh, shift that you made with the shootout, it's the same idea where it's like, you know, they're going to make a lot of choices and what you wrote down as a page may end up being a five minute fight. You never know right. what they're going to do with it. Yeah. yeah. Right. Or even, even like I said, you know, I really think you should play down the sci the sci-fi element <laughs> in a different director's hands. They could, that could be the main thing that they want to push. You, <laughs> yeah. you never know, you know exactly. what I mean? But um, anyway, uh, on their own, I thought it was really cool reading the montage because at this point it's kind of solidifying that idea of, I don't know what it is. You know, I, I may think I know what it is, but, you know, the more thought I put in this, I don't know which one of these or a combination of these is doing it. And to see them all back to back now, um, I thought that was really cool. Fantastic. Oh, this is going to be, this is gonna be another, uh, another section of great job, Renee. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, good. You're going to love these notes. I'm like, well, there's nothing really to do now. Now I have no excuse. I just got to write 10 more pages because there are no rewrites to do at yeah. this point. Yeah. Exactly. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> no, it's fine. You know, uh, what's nice about this sequence that we're in so far or currently, yeah. um, you know, they're short and I already, this is one of the more solid areas of the treatment that we discussed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's just a matter of getting it on paper, but right, I right. know how it's going to play out. So one, one thing that it, it, if you feel like researching it for me, Brian, I just yep. chose this, um, rank for the fort commander. Okay. Uh, which is, I think, Lieutenant Major. Lieutenant. And I don't know if that is the correct. Yeah, Lieutenant Major. Here we are. Uh, I don't know if that is the correct rank or rather a believable rank for someone okay. who is the, uh, the commanding officer at a fort during this period. All right. I have no problem doing that. Um, one other little thing, when um, when Stan looks through the window at Sally Saloon after the cheer hmm. and then walks over to Nine Lives, it was a nice little cohesive element also. Because, you know, that's, that's another thing where a director is going to take that and he's going to be walking down the street, hears something, does that, you know, and kind of mulling thing over, things over. He's Maybe he's fixing his shirt because he's about to go into Nine Lives or whatever. Totally. You know, and, but it's a nice transition again. Yeah. Um, Rather than just having these things back to back, you know, where am I? No, he's he's actually going to take you right there. He's going to look at Sally's. He's going to take you right over to Nine Lives now, and 
little touches like that, man. I think you, you had some inspiration this week because all your little changes made so much sense. Love, 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 love. Heart with an arrow. <laughs> all right, man. Well, great. Uh, I felt pretty good. I, I'm glad I went back through the pages to kind of shore things up and uh, just realign my mind with you know where the script was and where it's going. Um, we'll probably have to have another milestone episode mm-hmm. in another you know another forty pages or so just to make sure we're still on track. But yeah. uh, I feel pretty good. Yeah, man, I do too. Um, my one note at the end of this was arg. I want to read the turn. You know what I mean? I'm like waiting for it now. Come on, man. Stop teasing me, Renee. Stop yeah. teasing me. Yeah. Please and don't so, make that a standalone episode. <laughs> you know, that's the other thing. Uh, I wasn't sure how the turn, like it, originally I was thinking the turn would be kind of in phases. But as I was writing this, I thought, you know what? It makes, I think it, it makes easier viewing if we can have the turn happen after a particular moment. Mm-hmm. And that's when we can decide or the audience can decide, well, was it this particular thing or was it all of these other things rather than, you know, say, oh, well, this guy started turning before this event happened. So this event couldn't have affected this guy. So we kind of right. have to have all of the variables take place before people start turning. Yeah. No, I like this. I like it this way. Okay. I think it just makes, makes a lot of sense. Wait a second. The cut? What? You're thinking about Bill and or whatever? The no, arm, or what no. You... I'm thinking um, about the soldier in the fort because I just, this is the thing that's destroying what I just said. He died already. A, he He's died. Too... And B, he already kind of had these zombie symptoms beforehand. So this is the one variable that doesn't fit what I just said. And I need him. No, no, he can. Okay, never mind. Never mind. He can rise after the last thing that I need to happen, which is the uh, the Indian bandit dying and cursing mm. everybody. Okay. Oh, yeah, this works perfectly. It works perfectly. Indian bandit's going to die in Epitaph, and then we can cut to the fort. And, you know, the soldiers that brought the dead soldier in, Yeah. you know, they can be waking up, they walk into the hallway, and down at the other end of the hallway, they see their buddy just like shuffling away. Like, oh, he's not dead. He's alive. And then once they come up to him, he turns around. Ah! Ah! <laughs> Are you going to write that? <laughs> I'm just going to make my face, take a picture of my face, put it in the script. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Cool, man. Solid 48. All right, Brian. Well, uh, is there anything else we need to, to add here? Anything we need to talk about? No? You know, the only thing I'll say is uh, this is maybe a little bit more on the on the retrospective part of this, you know, kind of like what we talked about earlier and the choices that you make. Um, so unbeknownst to you, one of the things I, I did while I was in L.A. since I was so like just wanted to get myself out of that place physically is mentally I kind of did. You know, and what I did is I started writing. And, um, I thought, you know, I, and I'm not going to go into the, um, the actual, uh, meat of what I wrote, but I will say that it's concerning a project that you and I talked about that I wanted to do, um, for a, uh, a scripted podcast with particular participants in it. And, um, so I started kind of thinking about that and giving a little bit more, um, <clears throat> just giving a little more mental, mental space to that. And <clears throat> as I did that, uh, and, and really, you know, I'm not used to writing like this. I've written creative, creatively, certainly, but I've never tried to write a script before uh, per se. So to do this, I really just kind of let myself go a little bit. And um, I started defining characters and defining the situations. And before I knew it, as, as I was doing kind of like a preliminary uh, treatment, I kind of, it started to kind of shift into something completely different. And it was not that it was writing itself, but I was being taken someplace logically you know as i was watching this movie in my head and it brought me back to that that thought of you know if i was to sh- if i was in your spot and i was then sharing this with you um i mean unless you saw something logically problematic with what i was doing or or you know something more um uh 
more within, like you said, you know, that, that, uh, uh, that alleyway or however you describe corridor. it. The corridor, exactly. Yeah. Um, within that, you know, that makes sense. But at the end of the day, if I'm writing something, I'm defining it. And to have someone take me outside of that without good reason, really good reason, um, is really, I don't know if I want to use the word disrespectful, but it is not, not necessarily appropriate. You know what I mean? And so it gave me, um, and this, this happened on the heels of me offering probably my most critical criticism to you. You know, it, it just gave me a little bit of a, of an insight into being on your side and how I would have responded probably wouldn't have been quite as nicely as you did, but, um, just, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that I just gave myself this, this perspective on what you're going through and, um, I guess all this is just to, 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 to somehow compliment you again, <laughs> but no, but seriously, it, it did give me um, an, an insight, which I didn't have before because at some point I was just like, I really like where this is going. I wouldn't like someone to change it. You yeah, know what I mean? Totally. And um, maybe certainly to massage certain things or, you know, help me get somewhere a little bit faster or, you know, if I, if I run into a, a wall, absolutely. But at the end of the day, I'm pulling stuff out of the ether and I'm creating at that point yeah. and, there has to be a respect for that process and for that person's vision. Right. So um, anyway, it was just a, maybe it was because mentally I had just done that with you and I was like feeling, you know, um, I don't know. It was, it was weighing on me a little bit because I didn't want you to, you to take that in the wrong way. And, you know, just maybe it was the prep for last week where I was kind of, you know, uh, worried about delivering some of that news to you about how I was feeling about some of those, those things. Um, so maybe that was the at least the uh, the genesis of of why that happened. But put that putting that together with this experience that I have was really revealing, man, and uh, uh, really interesting. Gave me a new uh, a, a new level of of respect for what you're going through in, in making this. Hey, I appreciate that, man. And uh, you know everything I said last time um, in the outtake, I think, <clears throat> yeah, it still holds. You know. Uh, and if, I think everybody has the capacity to be a writer. Yeah. But I don't think everybody understands what it takes to to be a professional writer and <laughs> right. be able to, you know, to take criticism and, and know what criticism to discard, if you will. Now, I know yeah. that sounds horrible as someone who's like, say, hey, man, I need some feedback. And then I just <laughs> discard the feedback. Um it is, I mean, that's part of it, right? Like, just because someone gives you feedback doesn't mean that they are necessarily right and that you are necessarily wrong. Right. Uh, it, but it can help to inform the, well, it can help to inform certain aspects of what you're writing uh, and then also reaffirm your stance on things that if something someone said isn't persuasive, then you feel very strongly about um, this aspect of of the the story or the script, the uh, the marketing copy, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, uh, for better or worse. And you know, it it you you as the creator have decided that this is integral. Um, yeah, and that can only come from a lot of a lot of experience as a writer. So there we are, Brian. I'm I'm happy that you had a little little. Taste, taste of that <laughs> <laughs> i did it's, you know, it and, and uh nothing may come of this who knows but you know i well dream and it reminds me i was listening to uh script notes the uh this podcast with professional script writers you know who are you know we're published and have 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 sold several um scripts and uh this guy one, one of the uh um one of the uh, people on that show one of the hosts john august the other guy oh he was talking about uh, going to a party and he was there and he's talking to this, just hands up talking to a banker and the banker's like, yeah, I was, I was going to write a, I was thinking about writing a script. And the guy says, yeah, I was thinking about opening a bank. <laughs> I was like, go. Oh man, touche. That's so true. So I yeah. will not fool myself into thinking that I'm going to do a good job with it or even do it, but I'm going to, at this point, continue on along the process and who knows something may come of it. Who knows? Maybe we'll do a show about me someday. <laughs> Well, yeah, we'll we'll see. You're like, probably not. <clears throat> no, because I mean, hey, next, I've got the next four seasons wrap, right? I hate to tell you. <laughs> well, you know, look, if it's the right project, uh, season six, Brian, talk to me then. That's what I'm saying. 
Uh, I need to test something really quickly, and let's let's just do it live. Let's do, we'll it, do live. it live. Uh, let's see here. Oh yeah, that's awesome. Wait, <laughs> is that awesome? Okay, wait a second. No, we're fine. Okay, fantastic. Uh, for some reason, there was this little like tooltip open on the PDF, uh. and I couldn't make it go away, and I wasn't sure if it had been there the whole time, and actually recorded on our our video here but it doesn't look like it it was so all right all right all right all right all why right Ryan? Doing, why aren't you doing a mcconaughey <clears throat> voice for anyone uh, i guess i can characters add coming well, <laughs> just start, new characters <laughs> just start practicing all of these celebrity voices and then right. try to get them later <laughs> renee why does it say all right all right all right yeah. really someone would say that brian don't you worry Anyway, you know, uh, for our animatic, rather than hire all of these like uh, professional voiceover guys, right. why don't we just get like a uh, Ross Marquand or you know one of these guys who who like Frank Caliendo or right. whatever, and just have <laughs> them do guy. all the different voices. <laughs> That's right. This guy sounds like John Madden. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. Boom! You go there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well then. <clears throat> Let's just pull up the website so everyone can see it. This is letswritethismovie.com, where I put up new pages every week, roughly around Thursday. And let me just click on one so you can see what the post looks like. This is the most recent one. And I do a little blog post, try to catch everybody up on uh, you know what's going on with me regarding the script, maybe some big changes. And then you get to read all of the pages here in this little PDF viewer. And our hope is that you will find some something to have feedback on and leave a comment here in the comment form below. Or as you watch these episodes on YouTube, you can leave a comment on any of our videos. I will read them. And if it's feedback regarding the story, I am happy to discuss them with Brian and see if and how uh, well, rather, if they fit well with this project or this script. And that is all I have to say. Brian, there, anything uh, else? Where where can they find us on uh, social? Oh, you can also find us on uh, Twitter. And the handle is writethismovie. At writethismovie. Right with a W. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Sorry, guys. I don't. Okay. You know what? Fine. Fine. Didn't have this prepped. We'll just go to Twitter. We're just gonna go to Twitter right now. Hang on. Oh, good. I have to sign in. Okay. Forget it. We're not doing this. We'll do it next episode. Next time. Next time. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a like and a subscribe. Tell your friends. Tell your family. Tell your enemies trying to grow yeah. our presence and your subscription really helps us if there's nothing else brian i'm just going to sign off yes that's it man all right Important next week we'll see you next week all right and we're out brian come back to me <laughs> come back to me okay we're rolling all right uh i always look forward to my weekends throughout the work week because yeah. i just think like you know as soon as five o'clock on friday hits i'm just thinking okay this is my time transition to all of my personal projects and let's let's get some stuff done right uh. and then what did i do friday night i don't think i i did uh anything like like really for this i mm. think i watched a lot of earwax removal videos on YouTube, just like one after another. I'm like, yeah, get that earwax. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, Brian, I'm getting a, an internet connection unstable message. Uh-oh. Are you getting that That's in your okay. end? No, it'll probably just me, be me really low res on the video. <laughs> no, you look fine. Yeah, we'll looks see. Fine. I, I just have never seen that message before. Hmm. Uh, and that was, um, I think that was an OBS message. Oh, not, not anything else. And that's weird. 
anyway maybe it's because it knew it was it was tracking you and knew you're about to get in some very uncomfortable um discussion points exactly earwax so would, removal oh do it again obs <laughs> <laughs> wiggle the internet cord exactly 